Hey everybody. So while we let people in, oh, we're just going to get started with this problem on the board. Um, there will be a weekly quiz this week, so we'll get back to those uh, now that we've had an actual full week of lecture. That will be up by this afternoon. Okay, I think we probably got everybody here who's coming. And just a few, or just an announcement for those of you who just joined us. I got a question about the uh, weekly quiz as people were coming in. So I just wanna let you know that there will be a weekly. Hmm. Okay. Um, can people give me a thumbs up if they can hear me? Or, or anybody send me a message in the chat if you can hear me. Okay. Okay. Um, good. Okay, so looks like most people can hear me. Okay, yeah, so, so sorry. What I was saying is just that there will be a weekly quiz um, now that we've had an actual full week where, where we met every time. I'll put that up this afternoon. It's, it's not available yet. Okay. So when we left off last time, we were talking about, um, mainly about filtration at the glomerulus. And we had started to talk a little bit about the proximal tubules, I believe. We're gonna spend most of our time in the proximal tubules today. Um, but we had also learned how to calculate a number of different things. We've been talking about rates, so rates of filtration. We talked about uh, filtered loads and we talked about filtration fractions. So our warm up problem is asking us about one of those, specifically about filtered load because this is one of the things that's potentially going to be important to you in the future when you're um, thinking about common things like diabetes. The filtered load of glucose is something that you're really going to want to answer. So I figured we should do a practice problem on that since it's useful. So for this practice problem, we're given a renal plasma flow of 625 milliliters per minute. So that's how much blood, how much plasma, is getting to the kidney every minute. We have a glomerular filtration rate of 125 milliliters per minute, which is a typical value. So that's how much of the plasma, how many milliliters of that 625 are actually going into our nephrons, getting filtered uh, out of the glomerular capillaries and into Bowman's space, and then becoming filtrate through the nephron. We also have our plasma glucose concentration here given as 160 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so this is higher than the example we walked through in class last time. So we wanna know what the filtered load 
of this new higher glucose level would be. So the way we do that, looking at this. So our equation for filtered load is just the glomerular filtration rate times the concentration of whatever we're tracking in the plasma. And that's because uh, we're, we're filtering almost everything from the plasma into the uh, Bowman's capsule, into the nephron, right? This is not a very fiddly process, right? All we're really keeping in that plasma is the proteins and red blood cells. Otherwise the filtrate is identical to the concentration of everything in the plasma. So if we wanna know our filtered load of glucose, we wanna know the GFR, so the glomerular filtration rate. So we know that's 125 milliliters per minute. Now we need to multiply that times our concentration in the plasma. So here we were given that our plasma glucose was 160 milligrams per deciliter. So we wanna convert the units, right? Do a little dimensional analysis uh, because we often measure our plasma glucose in milligrams per deciliter, but we're giving our GFR in milliliters, milliliters per minute. So we do do that conversion, which is pretty easy, right? So 160 milligrams per deciliter is equivalent to 1.6 milligrams per milliliter. So then we just do our multiplication to get our filtered load. So we're multiplying our GFR, right? This was our GFR. So this is how much fluid we have moving into the nephron every minute. This is the concentration of the glucose in the plasma and therefore also in that fluid. When we multiply those together, we get a filtered load of 200 milligrams per minute. And we wanna pay attention to these values. So this is, this is higher than our typical, right? Our typical plasma glucose was about 100, right? Which was one milligram per milliliter. That's what we did in class on Wednesday, which gave us a filtered load of 125. So you can see our filtered load is going up here. Now at a certain point, as we'll talk about today, um, once this filtered load gets too high, it's eventually um, going to get to a point that the uh, transporters in the cells in the proximal tubules where our glucose gets moved from the filtrate and the nephron back into the blood. Um, once this gets too high, we can actually fill up all those proteins, those transporters in the cell walls. So at a certain point, we're going to be so high that actually some of that glucose is going to stay in the urine, so stay in the fluid, um, because we don't really have enough room to, to move it into the blood. So we wanna pay attention to this level of the filtered load, um, because at certain points, it, it's going to become a problem for us. Okay. So just a reminder of where we are. So we start, we're actually looking at the nephron now and we're trying to understand our different terms, filtration, right? Filtration, we've talked about, we're also going to be talking about reabsorption. That'll be a big topic today. Reabsorption. Absorption. We're also going to talk about secretion and excretion. I'm just writing these down so that as we kind of talk through the bits of the nephron, we're kind of going through these four concepts in parallel with talking about the parts of the nephron. So I just want to make sure we have all of this in our head at once. Okay, so we talked about filtration happening up here at the start of our nephron in the glomerular capsule, which is also called Bowman's capsule, and this sort of combination of our arterioles coming in, becoming glomerular capillaries, going out, 
and this Bowman's capsule surrounding it is called our renal corpuscle. So this is where we have filtration happening. Filtration being the movement of our fluid out of the plasma with all its solutes, all its normal concentrations, except for proteins and red blood cells. And they're crossing the uh, barrier of the endothelial cells on those capillaries, a basement membrane, and then the epithelial cells here in the nephron, which we call podocytes. So they're crossing this layer uh, because of the pressures, uh, the glomerular filtration pressures they're crossing into the nephron and then they're going to be moving down the rest of the nephron. We're gonna see that here in the proximal tubule where we're going next, we're going to see a lot of reabsorption happening. So that's, that's where we're moving next and this is where we've been. So at the very end of Wednesday, we did talk a little bit about the regulation of the glomerular filtration rate as well. So I wanna make sure um, that we understand how this looks in a flow chart as well as uh, kind of listed out for us. So our three types that we talked about are three types of intrinsic regulation were our myogenic regulation, we talked about our tubuloglomerular regulation. And we talked about the role of the mesangial cells, so mesangial regulation. Okay. So these are all ways that we can keep our glomerular filtration rate consistent, kind of regardless of, of our mean arterial pressure or of our blood pressure, and how we, how we can kind of adjust uh, so that we're not losing too much fluid, basically, and, and kind of adjust the blood volume to kind of help that mean arterial pressure. So if we step through, all right, on the right here, we're looking at myogenic regulation. So myogenic regulation refers to the fact that we have smooth muscles in those arterioles that are entering the nephron and becoming the glomerulus and then exiting. And so the, at smooth muscle, when it gets stretched out, when there's more blood flowing through it, it has an automatic response that it wants to clamp back down, it wants to constrict. So here we see the kind of flow of what would happen. So our initial stimulus on these diagrams is always in green, right? So the initial thing that happens here in this diagram so that we have our mean arterial pressure go up, right? So this is basically getting higher blood pressure, right? So the effect this has in our arterioles, in our kidneys, is that we're likewise going to have our pressure go up in that afferent arteriole. So as pressure goes up, that means there's more blood, there's more plasma pushing against those walls of the arterioles, which means that they're stretching out that smooth muscle. We have this automatic constriction response. So we increase basically the contraction of those muscles, which is going to increase the resistance. Okay. So that's what's happening with the smooth muscle, but I want us to also kind of focus on what's going on with our GFR, right? Our glomerular filtration rate. So this sort of right-hand side, it's our correction method. Um, but I want us to think about what we're correcting. All right, so actually I'll pick a different color to kind of trace us down the right-hand side, or the, sorry, the left-hand side. Okay. So usually, or initially, if we have this rise in pressure, right? rise in mean arterial pressure, and then our rise in the pressure in the afferent arterial, this is going to raise the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure in those glomerular capillaries, right? And when we raise the hydrostatic pressure in those glomerular capillaries, right, that's one of our Starling's forces, right? And it's one of our forces 
that creates the glomerular filtration pressure, which remember is just adding up our forces for filtration and then subtracting from that our forces opposing filtration. So raising blood pressure essentially is raising the pressure in the capillaries, therefore raising the filtration pressure. Therefore, when we have a higher filtration pressure, right, we have more forces for filtration. That means that we are going to speed up our filtration rate, right? There's more pressure, so more is gonna go through, right? Because we have a stronger pressure. So this is a problem because if we have more, um, more getting filtered out through the glomerulus, right? We might be losing fluid. And we might want that a little bit, right? If we're trying to long-term lower mean arterial pressure, but so long as we're in a certain kind of normal range, we're not too far out, we want to, to maintain our glomerular filtration rate the same. So that's when this, this uh, sort of feedback from our smooth muscle comes into play, right? So as our smooth muscle in the arterioles bounces back in response to that stretch, shrinks down the radius of that arteriole, increasing the resistance. This means that in the glomerular capillaries, which come after the arteriole, right? If we've constricted the arteriole bringing blood, in the capillaries, we now don't have as much blood as we did before. So this is lower, lowering our glomerular capillary pressure. So this would be negative feedback on this final end bit, right? On this bit. Right, because now if we lower our glomerular capillary pressure, that's the hydrostatic pressure in those glomerular capillaries. So it's a force for filtration. That means we're going to lower our overall glomerular filtration pressure, which will lower our GFR back down to its normal rate. On the right-hand side, we're looking at a different form of feedback, the tubuloglomerular feedback. So here, we're still looking at the same initial stimulus, this raise in blood pressure, this raise in MAP. And some of this diagram is the same, right? The flow through the glomerulus has all the same kind of pressures and forces acting on it, right? So we still see this part where if we have a rise in blood pressure, a rise in MAP, that's going to increase the glomerular capillary pressure, which is that glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, which is a force for filtration. So it increases the glomerular filtration pressure, increasing the GFR. So that's all the same. That's all a direct result of this rise in MAP. What we have different here is we're looking at a different type of feedback so instead of looking at the smooth muscle here in the arterial just bouncing back, we're looking at what happens due to the fact that we have these macula densa cells later on in the nephron that are going to respond to the fact that because more fluid is getting filtered into the nephron because of this high GFR, this means we're gonna have lots of fluid flowing past those macula densa cells at the end of our nephron. And their response to this is to send out a paracrine signal. So paracrine signal, um, kind of like hormones, right? Hormones are endocrine, paracrine is just local. So they're sending out a local signal, a paracrine signal back to the arterioles, right? So the arterioles are, are what's receiving that signal. So that paracrine signal from the macula densa cells in the tubule, the distal tubule, tells the arterial to constrict, tells us to increase resistance, and we can see that this is the same, right? So, so we're having the same effect, we just have like a different factor that's telling us to increase the resistance, thereby decreasing glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, thereby lowering our filtration pressure, lowering our GFR, 
which then turns off the signal at the end, right? As we lower the GFR, the flow later on then tubules is going down. So now we don't secrete this paracrine signal anymore. Actually, qu questions about these two forms of uh, feedback intrinsic regulation before we move forward. Okay, cool. All right, so those three forms, the two we just ran through, plus the mesangial cells, which basically kind of turn off some of the glomerular capillaries, were forms of intrinsic control. So the intrinsic control is happening here in the range of 80 to maybe about 180. So this is where we have the intrinsic control, creating this plateau in our glomerular filtration rate. So this plateau in GFR, right? So that's where we'd have intrinsic. If we have our mean arterial pressure lower, or higher than this zone, we're gonna see that first off, this is not all that well controlled, right? We're going to use different mechanisms to try to exert any control in these regions. Um, so here's where extrinsic control of GFR would be more important. Um, but we're also going to say, see that the decreases or increases in the blood pressure really are going to be having having a full effect on GFR. And this is because of some of those uh, same pressures that we just walked through in that flow chart, All right? So if we have a decrease in blood pressure, so if we're in this region of the chart, right? If we decrease our blood pressure, we are going to be decreasing that hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries which means we are decreasing the filtration pressure, which means that we are lowering the filtration rate. And we can see that when we are in this region, this, this is not all that well controlled. It's because we don't have this intrinsic regulation, can't, can't keep us in control there. So we need extrinsic control. The extrinsic control mainly is, is sympathetic activity uh, in the ways that we talked about when we were talking about the capillary, or sorry, the cardiovascular system, I should say. Um, so times we're gonna see the uh, blood pressure dropping like that are like in hemorrhage or in, in excessive sweating, right? So any way that we lose a bunch of blood volume, right, sweating, if you're super, super sweating, you're losing a lot of fluid from your blood, dropping blood volume. If you're hemorrhaging, you're just like losing a lot of blood, period. All right, so both of these would drop blood volume. And so a big effect of that drop in blood volume is going to be a drop in venous pressure. And this is, this is what we talked through in, I think it was our first unit for, for this semester, right? So when we have this drop in venous pressure, one of the things we see is that our baroreceptors are detecting and responding to that. That has the effect of increasing sympathetic nervous activity, right? That's, that's their kind of reflexive response. And we have similar things happening in the heart, right? Leading to that sympathetic nervous response. As we have this drop in venous pressure, not as much blood comes back to the heart, which means not as much blood comes out of the heart, which means our MAP, or MAP, or mean arterial pressure is dropping. Again, our baroreceptors are detecting that. And so they're increasing the sympathetic nervous activity. The reason we're doing that partially is because we want to increase sympathetic nervous activity so that we can kind of uh, constrict our arterioles, right? Raise resistance. So that's happening in the kidneys, just like it's happening other places. So there's going to be sympathetic nervous activity in the kidneys. So renal sympathetic nervous activity is gonna go up. We'd see vasoconstriction, so constriction of, of that smooth muscle around both the afferent and the efferent arterioles, which means the kidneys overall 
are going to have high vascular resistance, um, which means that basically we're not going to send as much blood to the kidneys, uh, right? In sympath a sympathetic response, right? We know that we're gonna wanna send blood to the skeletal muscle instead, for example. So it's not gonna go to the kidneys, it's gonna go to other systems, right? Because of this rise in the renal vascular resistance. So since we don't have blood coming to this kidney, we are going to lower our glomerular filtration rate, right? Because we don't have as much hydrostatic pressure in those glomerular capillaries. As we lower this glomerular filtration rate, we're not gonna pee as much, right? We're not gonna create as much urine because we don't have as much fluid there, which means that we're going to be controlling fluid loss, right? So if we're losing fluid up here at the top, because we're sweating or we're hemorrhaging, right? We don't want to also lose fluid through excretion. So we're gonna drop the fluid loss by uh, stopping producing urine, which is gonna act as a big negative feedback loop on blood volume, right? Because we're gonna be keeping this fluid in the blood. Okay. So that's, that's the, the basic big negative feedback loop that we're trying to do, this, this sort of bigger control of blood volume and therefore pressure uh, using our kidneys. We do have um, other feedback loops happening as well, uh, right? So we have a direct effect of the blood pressure directly dropping GFR, right? Because that plasma flow is dropping. Uh, and we have this other negative feedback loop uh, where an increase and the vascular resistance is increasing our total peripheral resistance, right? Because remember that total peripheral resistance is just a sum of the resistance everywhere in the body, which is helping us raise our mean arterial pressure as well, right? So there are like two ways here that the kidneys are helping us correct a drop in blood pressure, right? One way we're correcting the drop in blood pressure is by regulating blood volume. And the other way we're regulating the blood pressure is by increasing resistance and increasing total peripheral resistance. So this is why part of why the kidneys are, are really important for control of blood pressure. And the other thing that we're gonna see is uh, that their regulation of solutes and of water is also super important, but, but that kind of goes into this urine flow bit. So we're gonna have more details here. Okay. So that was all kind of at the top of our nephron, right? Concerning the glomerulus, the renal corpuscle, concerning filtration from the plasma into the nephron. So into this sort of filtrate fluid running through our nephron. And the next thing we're going to be talking about is reabsorption. And reabsorption is going to happen in multiple places in the nephron, but um, one of our big important places that reabsorption is happening is in the um, proximal tubule, the proximal convoluted tubule. So what reabsorption is, is we're going to have movement from our tubule. Right? So here's the tubule part of my nephron. We're going to have movement into the capillary that is running alongside the tubule. So we're gonna have a solute moving out of the tubule into the blood, which means it's gonna go back into your systemic circuit, gonna circulate back around through your body. And so super important, we're gonna see a lot of reabsorption of water. We don't want to lose too much water. We don't want to excrete all that much water in our urine. There's a certain amount we need to excrete, but most of that we want to keep in our blood in order to maintain blood volume. We're also going to be reabsorbing things that we use as nutrients, right? Uh, so we talked at the beginning about glucose. Glucose is one of the really important things that we're going to be reabsorbing, right? It does initially get filtered into our nephron but we wanna take it back. We wanna use that to make ATP. We don't wanna lose it in the urine. So uh, this reabsorption is mostly going to be occurring in the proximal tubules. Most of it is not going to be regulated, right? We're gonna be doing kind of bulk reabsorption, especially of water in this region. 
here is a table for overall rates of filtration and reabsorption for water and some of our solutes. Um, so I want you to just kind of skim and take a look at that. All right, what we're looking at is how much of these substances went into the nephron, went into the kidney, right? So the filtration rate became filtrates, started to go through the nephron versus how much gets reabsorbed. So how much goes back to the bloodstream, right? How much of this are we not excreting? How much is not becoming urine? And then they gave us a nice percentage at the end, right? So we don't have to just control, just concentrate on the raw numbers. So we can see that lots and lots of things are being almost entirely reabsorbed, right? Glucose is at 100%, right? We, we really want to keep all our energy if we can, but we also want to keep almost all of our water. We want to keep solutes, right? We want to keep sodium, right? We know sodium is really important for the body. Um, we're keeping a lot of other ions that we use for various things. Um, we are going to try to keep our bicarbonate ions, which are important for blood pH. Uh, so there are a lot of things that we're trying to keep in our bloodstream, even though they do initially get filtered into our kidneys, right? Differing amounts, but we're, we're reabsorbing lots and lots of stuff. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the details of this reabsorption. So most of the reabsorption is happening in the proximal convoluted tubules. So the proximal convoluted tubules are like the second-ish step of our nephron, right? We had our glomerulus at the beginning, which is those capillaries leading us into Bowman's capsule, Bowman's space, which is kind of the mouth eating the glomerulus. And the proximal convoluted tubule is what comes next. Some solute reabsorption is gonna happen in the distal convoluted tubule as well, which is kind of at the end of the nephron, um, but that's gonna be more regulated. Uh, so, so we'll get there when we get there. So the barrier for reabsorption is similar to, to the barrier for filtration, except um, it's not as leaky, basically. So we still have layers right? We still have epithelial cells, right? So here we see our epithelial cells in the renal tubule. And we still have endothelial cells, endothelial cells in the capillary, right? The walls of the capillary. And there actually still is a basement membrane as well. When this says that the endothelial cells of the capillaries are minimal in parentheses, what it's actually just saying is that most of the barrier, most of the part like blocking stuff is in this case, the epithelial cells of the renal tubule. Uh, whereas before it was mostly the capillary walls that were blocking filtration. Uh, so we can see overall that this is gonna be more of a barrier if we kind of look at these uh, epithelial cells in the renal tubules. When we were looking at the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, we had these uh, podocytes, right, that had these kind of foot processes and these slip pores, right, kind of just sitting on the capillaries. So there was like lots of space where stuff could filter out into the filtrate, right? It was really just kind of blocking proteins and red blood cells and not much else. Um, but we can see now when we're looking at our proximal tubules that we actually have tight junctions between these cells, right? And they're pressed quite close together. So they're going to be more of a barrier, or more of a successful barrier than we saw when we were looking at the glomerulus and overall the renal corpuscle. This is just a zoomed in picture and it's emphasizing to you that what's happening here is reabsorption, right? So if we wanted to reabsorb something that's in the filtrate, we'd need to move it through our tubule epithelial cell. We'd then need to move it through like the, the slight space between that uh, epithelial cell and the capillary 
and then we'd need to move it into the plasma itself. So this is reabsorption moving from the tubule into the capillaries. So we've mentioned before the fact that lots and lots of water is filtered per day, but we don't lose that much volume from our blood um, because that would be impossible and also very bad. Only about one to two liters a day is excreted as urine. And this is because of reabsorption. So we are reabsorbing this water, right? It started out in our nephron, got filtered into the nephron, but we are yoinking that back out. That's the reabsorption. There is a certain amount of fluid that you do need to keep in this filtrate and that's becoming urine um, because there are certain waste products that you are trying to get rid of. And if you got rid of all the water, you wouldn't be able to excrete waste products. Um, that minimum is about 400 milliliters. So only about 400 milliliters of what you're excreting is obligatory water loss. But this number does become important in cases of like extreme dehydration, right? If you get lost in the desert and you have nothing to drink, right? You are still going to need to excrete 400 milliliters in order to get rid of those waste products. So that's really the problem um, in situations like that. So 85% of the reabsorption of water is occurring in the proximal tubules and the descending loop of Henle which is the, the part of the nephron we'll get to after the proximal tubule. Um, this part of reabsorption is unregulated, uh, which is to say we're like not using energy to do it. And we're not using hormones and stuff to do it. So here's kind of what's happening in our proximal tubule. So your book goes through uh, these imaginary solutes uh, X, Y, and Z. And I'm not frankly sure why they did that without just telling you what they are. <laughs> uh, I think it's a little more helpful to, to know what molecules we're tracking here. So I just want to kind of give you a key for this. So when we have this diagram with green, so green here is telling... Ooh, right green and green okay so green on these diagrams means we're looking at passive transport red means we're looking at active transport this is just for when, when you're going back to your textbook trying to decipher these diagrams which i hope you do uh, in general i find diagrams quite helpful and overall, what they're trying to tell you without telling you is that in this case, Y is an example uh, really of what's happening with sodium. Uh, X is a simple example kind of of what's happening with glucose. And Z is kind of, again, an example of what's happening with your chloride ions. Okay. And I think it's just helpful to kind of think about that at the front although this isn't showing you the exact type of transporter used for each. So that's it. When we are looking at our filtrate versus our plasma, when we start out, the osmolality of the filtrate is the same as that of the blood. So these are isoosmotic. So they have the same concentrations of everything right, in our filtrate versus in our blood. So in order to reabsorb things, we are going to need a little active transport, right? So we're gonna need some active transport going on because in isoosmotic situations, right? We wouldn't expect anything to move. Things are at equilibrium. But what we're gonna use in order to get this reabsorption kickstarted is sodium. So sodium is going to be actively transported out of the filtrate into the paratubular blood so that we can set up a concentration gradient that's gonna drive osmosis. So, so basically we wanna be able to suck water through. To do that, we need to move some solutes. So we can see that happening, told you why is sodium 
I think this is detailed out later, uh, but what we're seeing here, right, is that we have active reabsorption of sodium here. So this would be a sodium potassium pump, really. So we'd be lowering sodium concentration in the cell so that we can, by passive transport, draw sodium into the cell, lowering sodium concentration in the paratubular fluid and raising it, or sorry, lowering, lowering sodium concentration in the filtrate and raising it in the paratubular fluid. And the reason we wanna do this is that we want to be able to draw water by osmosis out of the filtrate. So once we set up this sodium gradient, this means that we're going to have water want to move in order to water down that sodium. So here we see the movement of water. So we can see it's passively, right, it's arrows green, following that sodium across and actually passively follows that sodium all the way into the plasma. So that is kind of the start of the reabsorption in the proximal tubule. That's part of why we have so much water being reabsorbed is because we're using this sodium. Now the sodium does, does do other things uh, as well. So the sodium is also going to kind of help us draw other solutes across. So this Z here, uh, I believe is trying to tell you without telling you how chloride ions get across. Um, so they are similarly following that sodium. Right, so we had high sodium here, right? All right, sodium is positive, chloride is negative. So it's attracted to that sodium kind of all the way across. Um, and we're also gonna see that sodium is important for glucose transport as well. So like everything else we talked about, sodium super important, sodium setting everything up. So if we take a look at these cells, all right, we've seen that they have tight junctions here, all right, between them. Those are sort of on the apical side and the apical side in the case of our nephron is gonna be the side that's facing the filtrate. So facing this fluid that's gonna become urine. So on this apical membrane, we can also see that's all squiggly, all right? So these squiggles are microvilli. They're increasing the surface area, which is helpful for reabsorption, right? We've got lots of space for that to happen. So a key component to how these cells are working is that they have low sodium concentration inside. Um, so I know anybody who took uh, Bio 1036, we actually walked through uh, exactly what's happening in an intestinal cell with uh, its glucose concentration, its sodium concentration. Um, so this is, if you were in that class, <laughs> uh, a throwback. Uh, but basically, right, we have our pump here, creating high sodium here, low sodium here, and therefore relatively kind of, well, let's call it medium sodium here, right? Because it's gonna be higher than the inside of the cell, but lower than, than over here in the paratubular fluid. Okay, so we have the filtrate sodium diffusing passively into the cell because it moves towards this low concentration. And then it's getting actively pumped into the paratubular fluid. Okay. So because we're pumping this sodium into the interstitial space, right? So our sodium is getting concentrated here, right? In this space, basically, right? Sodium is positive. Chloride ions are negative, right? So the chloride ions follow it, right? So chloride is also gonna start to get sort of concentrated here, although it's then going to go into the plasma as well. Um, so now we have 
both sodium and chloride hanging out there. All right, so we got sodium, lots of sodium here. We got lots of chloride here because they followed it. So then water is like, oh no, we gotta go water down those ions. So it passively by osmosis travels straight through trying to water those guys down. Okay. Then once all these uh, ions and water are here in the paratubular space, they also continue and, and just uh, diffuse into the paratubular capillaries. Okay, so they're going to continue forward. So it's really the, the active transport of sodium that is driving both the reabsorption of chloride ion and the reabsorption of water. And this is just this picture, again, that's been along the sidebar. So this slide, I want to be careful with you guys. It is telling you about reabsorption, but it's specifically telling you about salt and water reabsorption, and those are not the only things that are reabsorbed. Um, but we did have salts, so our chloride ions, our sodium ions, and water moving from the glomerular capillaries into the filtrate. They then make it into our proximal tubule, where they are mostly reabsorbed into the capillaries that would be lining here, right? So we'd have our uh, efferent arterial continuing along and becoming our paratubular capillary, right? So that's where we're reabsorbing this stuff into. So this re reduces the fluid to about a third of the original volume. So the next thing we wanna talk about is transport maximum. And really we're talking about this because, because we're thinking about glucose. This would be true for, for certain other molecules, but we mainly care because we care about glucose. Uh, so the transport maximum uh, is talking about the fact that right in order to move things across the cell, all right? So this is just my little cell. Oh, I should have made the apical membrane different. Okay, all right, so imagine the inside of my tubule is gonna be here. So this is our apical membrane. So this would be our basal membrane facing the blood. Okay. So in order to move a big thing across like glucose, right? Or anything that can't cross this membrane on its own we need to have transporters, so proteins embedded in the membrane in order to allow things to move through. So we hit the transport maximum when all of these are full, right? So we're using them, we're moving something through, but we have more stuff in our filtrate, so more of whatever molecule we're moving, then we have transporters that are able to move that um, molecule, okay. So that's when we hit our transport maximum kind of conceptually. So the rate of transport is going to stabilize and it's not going to increase anymore when our carriers, so those are our proteins, our transporter proteins are also called carriers. When they're saturated, right? Saturated just means they're completely full. So that's when we hit our transport maximum. This means that in our kidneys, we have a renal threshold, okay, for solutes that usually would be completely absorbed. So like glucose is normally 100% reabsorbed. We saw that in the table before. You normally wanna keep all your glucose. So it goes into the filtrate, starts out in the nephron, but we wanna get back all in the blood. But if we have so much glucose entering the nephron, that it saturates those carriers so we don't have enough of them in the membrane in order to pull them back into the blood, we're gonna get some solute excreted in the urine, which is basically like spillover. So that's what we see happening when we hit our renal threshold. Uh, and this is why like one of the old, super old timey ways of testing for diabetes was to test for um, glucose in the urine, right? Like I think, some people used to actually like taste it and see that it tasted sweet. Um, 
but when you hit your renal threshold for glucose, but, but also theoretically for other things, it means that, that even though you should be reabsorbing all of it, you don't have space. So it's, it's going to be present in the urine when it would not otherwise be. So this is just telling us that our example that we care about is glucose. Uh, and we'll talk about the numbers that correspond to transport maximum on Monday. So I'll, I'll let you go now. Okay. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. And I'll Thank make you. Quizzes up soon. <laughs>